So hey, I know a lot of people have been waiting for this build to finish, but I wanted to tell you that it all started with this faceplate right here. The actual uh, person that I'm building this clock for got this faceplate in Germany. And she said, hey John, do you think you could build the Weasley clock around it? And so I said, sure, let me give it a shot. So it all started right here with this. Before I started building this clock, I actually scoured the internet to find out what was out there and what this should look like. And what I came across is that there were a lot of different versions of this clock. So after talking to the person who wanted this clock, she liked the one that was most colorful. So if you're wondering why I went with the one with all colors, when there's different ones out there that are all wood type, and it would have been much easier to build, you'll have to take it up with her. But I'd still love to hear your comments on how I did. And uh, other than that, don't forget to subscribe and let's get cutting. As luck would have it, my neighbor just rebuilt his deck and I walked over to his scrap pile and started with these boards. So this is my starting piece. I will base the shape and size from this faceplate. In my head, making a clock this size was going to take a lot of wood, so without any measurements to go by, I decided to make a cardboard mock-up and adjust accordingly, then use the measurements from that. If you look at this clock in three sections, I will start with the top piece. This will allow me to ensure the faceplate looks proportional to the rest of the clock. There are also a lot of little pieces that you do not consider when looking at the clock as a whole. Using cardboard can help you figure out how you're going to do this in wood. Once the top portion is complete, you can work on the lower two sections. At this point, you will start getting really good at shaping cardboard. So with the lower two portions complete, you can stack your boxes to see how this will look. Although this is probably more proportional to the ones I see on the internet, I was not happy with the shape when comparing it to my own grandfather clock. And since I am making this up as I go along, I decided to go with what I thought would look more magical than something that might be considered goofy looking. Now I was ready to start cutting wood. Starting with the scrap deck wood, I decided to use these pieces to build the frames that would hold the thin light birch that I decided to make the boxes out of. This would give it the strength it needed and allow it to be extremely light. So I started by placing a scrap piece on its side and setting the fence so each cut would be a perfect square. Once all my squares were cut, I lowered the blade so that I would leave about 3 16 I also set the fence about 3 16 away from the blade. This would give me a perfect L-shaped rabbit once complete. Cut out one side and then simply rotate your square to cut out the other side. Then your rabbit is complete. Considering each box is just a cube, I knew I would need a minimum of 12 pieces per box. And with three boxes, I would need about 36 pieces. Each strip was close to four feet, so I cut about 12 strips. Starting with the base piece, we will set our miter saw to a 45 degree angle and start cutting frames. You can also use your framing jig if you have one. Once your pieces are cut, double and even triple check that your cuts are exact. I push them up against the back of my workbench and check that they are completely flush before any consideration goes into joining the pieces together. For those of you interested in my exact measurements, my bottom box will be 16 inches high, 16 inches wide, and 8 inches deep. But remember, I expect you to improve on my build. So, whatever means you have, join your corners together. So while my frames were drying, I started to cut the birch panels that would fill each box. Looking at your frames, measure from inside edge to inside edge, top and bottom, and then draw it out on your birch and make your cuts. From there, we are just simply going to glue in each piece. Again, the glue around the perimeter of the frame will give it even more strength. Now for the face of the box, you are going to use quarter inch medium density fiberboard. I want a little more strength on the face of each box so we can hang doors. With your piece in the frame, draw out a square about an inch from the frame. This will be for our window. Drill a hole in each corner to allow your jigsaw a little room to maneuver while you cut it out. You don't have to be perfect here while cutting because these lines will be hidden by the plexiglass frame. Now repeat the process of securing your panel into the frame. Once you have your front and back complete, you can repeat the entire process by creating your front and back frames for your center box. 
remember to use the quarter inch medium density fiberboard for the face so you can cut out your window. After your front and back pieces are dry, we can begin to fill in the side pieces to give the box its volume. Both the middle and the bottom box will have a depth of 8 inches. That is from edge of the frame to the edge of the frame. So your panels will be slightly smaller. I am going to set a clamp at exactly 8 inches to keep me in the standard. I will then cut one piece and then replicate that piece the exact same size. I will need eight pieces at just a little under eight inches. So I will cut the height of each piece individually to ensure a tight fit. So begin by cutting enough to completely fill in the box. Now you can just take individual measurements and cut each panel to fit without worrying about the frames not being perfectly aligned because all your cuts are already the same depth. In the end, this will give you a perfectly square box. And starting at the bottom of your clock, your box has to be perfectly square because you don't want to end up like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. This process is just repeated until all your boxes are filled in top and bottom and then you simply glue them into place. Going back to the top of the clock, let me slow down and be a little more clear on the change. Instead of filling the frame with the medium density fiberboard, we are going to make a face plate the exact same size as the perimeter of the face of the frame, and we will glue it right onto the face of the frame. Get this, with a pair of navy dividers, yes this pair was used by me back when I was an operations specialist at sea doing mo boards back in the 80s. I draw out an arch at the top of my inner square. Take your face plate and cut it out on the table saw. Now earlier we used a jigsaw for the windows, but this window will house the face plate, so we want it to be perfect. So using a miter saw, I cut the majority of each straightaway, and then I use a jigsaw to cut out the corners. And while you're at it, you can slowly cut out your arch. Unlike the other pieces, the face plate is glued to the outside of the frame. Put some glue on the perimeter of the frame and flip your frame over and align it perfectly. And then use a few clamps to ensure a tight bond. Allow time to dry, remove your clamps and see how it looks. Now you can go back and put your middle box together, the same as before, and continue to use your pre-cut pieces that were cut exactly to size. Okay, here you can see I am going too fast for my own good. Or you can just call me a knucklehead. But what the hell am I gluing here? At this point, your three main sections are built. Now comes the difficult part, all the flair that makes the clock magical. Everything here was purchased at Home Depot. I considered using a lathe to make this banister, but then that was a bit beyond a do-it-yourself project. I found some rope trim and cut it in half. Once you cut it in half, you can proceed to glue each flat side together to give you a full circle. While waiting for the spiral to dry, I moved along to building the cap of the top of the box. I took some quarter inch MDF and drew out my arch and the frill at the front of the clock. I used MDF because it glues together strong and is easy to cut without splintering. Cut your full arch out and then only cut one side of your top arch. Here I'm going to show you a little trick I used to make them perfectly match. With one half of your arch cut out, you can use the piece you just cut out to discount and double check that your other side of the arch is exactly the same. This will keep everything symmetrical. With the front cut out, you can trace out the back part of the cap by simply laying it on top and cutting it out. You don't need all the frill in the center on the back part, so just make it an arch. I took a hole saw and cut some corresponding pieces to give the frill some depth, and then I simply glued these on. MDF and glue work really good together, so it doesn't take long for your glue to set and these pieces to be ready. The cap had a look like it was two pieces put together. So to replicate this, I simply took a handsaw and lightly cut a line directly into the face. Then, using my front and back, I cut a square that was the exact same width. If your top box is 8 inches deep, then make this 9 inches deep. This will allow a half an inch all the way around the top cap so it will slide on the box without any obstruction. Remember the total cap dimensions are 14 inches by 9 inches. Sand the face and prime the top of the box with primer. 
Next, I use half inch MDF for the bottom and pieces in between each section. To figure out how big I needed each piece, I took my sections and held the banisters in place along the sides to see how much room I needed to make sure there was enough room for each piece. Then I simply made sure everything was square and I took it to the table saw to cut. Wanting only the fancy part of each banister to be seen, I cut both the top and bottom of each individually to ensure a tight fit and to make sure I had equal amounts on either side. You can screw or nail your banisters right through the top platform because we will be covering this with another piece. Once your primer is dry, you can go back and paint the corresponding colors to both your cap and your faceplate. Take your small decorative trim and cut plexiglass grooves into each piece. If you're a subscriber, then you know this is no different than the glass groove I cut into all my shadow boxes. Then use your framing jig or your miter saw to cut your pieces into a square for a window. Cut your plexiglass to fit and glue three corners together. Remove your plexiglass, paint to the desired color, and then glue in your last piece and your window is complete. To give it a little more support, I place a small staple in each side. Be very careful that you don't hit the plexiglass with your staple or it will shatter your plexiglass. Before the door is attached, I fasten my hinges in place. This is way easier than attaching them to the box first. I drill a small hole and insert a magnet so the door will stay firmly closed. Glue the quarter inch to the half inch and cut and then glue your trim into place. Then you can prime and paint. Don't waste paint on areas that will be covered by other boxes. After your paint dries, you can attach your banisters. I glue each one into position. You can also add an extra nail to keep them in place at this point. Slide in your bottom box, add some glue and staples to secure it. We will repeat the steps we used earlier to create our second frame. The only difference is the size and the color. Next, we will cut the two pieces between the bottom and the mid box that have all the spirals. One will be a quarter inch, the other will be a half inch, but they will be the exact same dimensions. Earlier, I knew I would have to build all the little spiral pieces myself, so here's how I did it. I started by cutting a one by one strip on the table saw. Then I took the strip to the miter saw and I cut out smaller individual squares. Each spiral would need a top and a bottom, so I ended up cutting 30 to give me room for error. I only needed 28. Now I could return to my spiral rope and I cut 14 identical pieces in length. They are around three and a half inches each. I drilled a bunch of countersink holes in each square just in case I needed to screw my pieces together. I glued all the spirals to the squares. Yes, this is time consuming, but I could not find anything that looked like these pieces and this was the cheapest way to go. A dab of glue and then squeeze them tight and then paint half of them garnet and paint the other half for screen. For the top piece, I bought four stair railing banisters. They were very long, so in order to use just the fancy part and not be stuck with much of the square part on either end, I cut a small section out of each one and then rejoined them. I used dowels to join the two new ends together. This gave me a smaller version of the same thing, so I had to just clamp them together and allow them time to dry. Going back to my center supports, I flipped over my quarter inch MDF and aligned it with my spirals, making marks over each spiral for pilot holes. Then I drilled in some countersink holes so the cover piece would lay flush once the screws were in place. Notice that I didn't bother to paint the top of this board since it was going to be completely covered by another board. This is why we can place screws directly into it, but the underside of this board, which is visible if you kneel down, is still all yellow. There was a slight variation where I joined my new pieces of banister together, so I quickly sanded it down flush. And then these were also painted for screen. I glued my last piece of MDF, which was baby blue, to the bottom of the spirals, and quickly aligned to make sure it was even all the way around. 
And again, using clamps to make sure the pressure maintains throughout the pieces. So to add a little more flair to the cap, I turned it on its face and traced out the arch to the circles. I let them extend out the length of the width of the banister. I then painted them and glued them on. I cut thin strips that were the same width as the top of each banister and the distance to cover both. The banisters were cut a half inch below the trim I had just added above. I glued my banisters into position and painted the tops yellow and set them out in the sun to dry. Once your paint dries, slide them under your flare and glue down onto your banisters and then clamp into place for a solid bond. I glued my top box into position and ensured it was evenly spaced around the square, then weighed it down until it was dry. Later I would add half inch screws for more support. Back to the front of the faceplate. There were these pieces that were between the banister and the faceplate, so I simply took some of the leftover banister and cut them to fit. Then I cut multiple lines in each one on the table saw, took them to the spray paint table, and I spray painted them the corresponding colors. And then I came back and simply glued them into position. I went back to Home Depot and purchased eight more banisters. These are the cheapest ones I could find. I was tempted to use leftover squares from the previous ones I cut, but I wanted a little bit of flare before the rope starts. This might be wasteful, but at this point I was all in and willing to incur the cost. I marked them and cut them down. I would need the top and bottom of each piece. For now, cut the squares a little long. We will cut them to fit when they are ready to be glued in. I thought the rope trim worked great replicating the spirals, so while I was at Home Depot, I purchased another piece of rope trim. This time I got the smaller 3 quarters version. This would be for the banisters on the side of the middle box. Again, not perfect, but it was the best and the cheapest I could find. I glued them together and put a little paint on them as sort of a primer because these things really absorb paint, so you will need all you have. Double check that every piece is the exact same length. So now we are going to drill countersink holes for the spirals to extend into. Find a spade bit that is the same circumference as the spiral rope. If you need to mark your bit with a sharpie or tape, do so. I will use the hole that is already in the bit. It is important that all your pieces are the exact same depth so they align well once put together the center of each piece and put a pilot hole in each one to keep the spade bit centered while drilling. For those of you who don't have a drill press, I thought it would be good to show you that you can do this without one. Use a flat surface, clamp your piece, and stay level. Pay attention to the mark that we placed on your bit, and just repeat this process until all eight are done. Once they're all cut, you can glue them together and prime and paint them. Remember, half will be eaten green the other half oasis blue. I had to bring them inside to dry because of the threat of rain. Moving on, we will now attach the top section to the middle section. First drill some pilot holes into the top of the middle box. Ensure you drill into the pine frame and not the birch. Then apply some glue on the frame and center your top section. Once perfectly centered, screw upward through your pilot holes into the MDF. Ensure your screws are half inch and no more. Instead of having to deal with the spirals all individually, I paired them up with their opposite color and glued them together. After they dried, I aligned them and marked them and cut them to fit. Then I simply glued them into position. Don't cut too much off. Tighter is better here. Once you have a really good tight fit, Put a little dab of glue on each end and push them, tap them, whatever it takes to get them into position. Having glued these pieces together, you only have to repeat this process four times instead of eight. Add the little pieces of trim where you think they are needed. Make them colorful if you want and then just glue them into place. For those of you who have watched this far, I will tell you that the making of the interior pieces of this clock are in a short separate video link that can only be found at the end of this video. I painted the interior of this clock flat black so when I painted the wooden interior pieces 
the glossy gold would stand out more and look less like wood. My last finishing touch to this clock was the small yellow circles on the faceplate. I simply cut them out of the quarter inch MDF and spray painted them yellow. You know how I love overkill. Overall, the most expensive part of making this clock, believe it or not, was all the paint. Thanks to my cardboard mock-up, I didn't waste any wood. So that completes the clock. I think it turned out fine, not bad for winging it. Would love to hear your comments below. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. What do you think I should make next?